Hey everybody, I'm Andres. I'm Scott. And I'm Abe. And this is Between Two Stands, a show that takes a closer look at the personalities that make up the DSO. Um, and we have a pretty awesome guest today, uh, but we're going we're gonna, to um, continue with, with another original composition from Cole, uh, just to kind of keep with the, the thematic uh, theme of, of, of you know, uh, music and composition. This is a good show. This is like the most celloist, composinist show we've ever done. I know. Right. I'm really excited about this show. Yeah, right. You're a little partial. Um, so before we get to, to Jeremy Crosmer, please uh, enjoy this original from Cole. <laughs> Today we're interviewing Jeremy Crosmer. Jeremy is a man of many talents. He received multiple graduate degrees from U of M on cello, composition, and music theory pedagogy and received his DMA all by the age of 24. He was appointed assistant principal cellist for the Grand Rapids Symphony in 2012 before joining the DSO in 2017. He's an avid composer writing music for GRS Music for Health Initiative his music ensemble Latitude 49, his group ESME, as well as writing for the DSO. Jeremy has taught music theory, pre-calculus, and cello. He draws mazes, writes science fiction, and plays country fiddle. So without further ado, please enjoy this piece played and written by Jeremy Crosmer.
Job, nice, nice. Sounded great. <laughs> great. <laughs> Thank you. That's as close to a standing ovation as we can give you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, these days. <laughs> um, so, so tell us a little bit about that. Uh, so this piece was, it wasn't exactly a dare, but it came up in conversation a couple weeks ago. Um, Hayden McKay, who's another cellist in the section, uh, was asking me why I hadn't written a piece for solo cello yet. And I gave it a lot of thought. Um, I have been intimidated by other pieces for solo cello by the great masters such as um, Bach, obviously, and then more 20th century people like Hindemith. Um, most people wouldn't put him in the master category, but I do. Um, Britain, uh, Kodai, Ligeti, Crumb. There's all these great pieces for solo cello, and I've been putting it off for decades. Um, so when he asked me that, I thought, you know, maybe I should just give it a shot. And so I took a different approach to this piece, which was rather than trying to compete or write a piece that lives up to the name of solo cello music that's already out there, um, I wanted to write a tribute to the great pieces themselves. So the movement that you heard was called Bachian Prelude, uh, kind of like the Bachianas Brasileiras by Via Lobos. Um, and it has a lot of elements of what a Bach Prelude would have, but in my style, uh, it kind of incorporates some of the other composers too. So everything's sort of mixed in. And then there's movements that uh, reflect, there's a movement that sounds like the second movement of the Crumb Sonata that theme and variations movement. Um, and then there's one that's kind of like the Britain sonatas and he, he actually wrote three. Uh, so I was sort of mimicking them and tr writing a tribute to them. And when I thought about music that way, rather than trying to compete, then it just sort of flowed. Uh, and so it, it took about three weeks to write this piece. Um, I mean, so you as a composer, I think this is a fascinating thing that we, we've had a few composer guests before, but um, composer and musician, especially performing your own piece, and I think it's fun to get in the weeds on, on some of these topics. So with the, those inspirations of the Bach and everything, was it like a linear similarity or is it textural or like how, what leads you in that way? Um, well, I, yeah, that's a great question. It's so hard for me to answer things as a composer because, uh, you know, you can talk, talk in generalities or specifics, but, um, for me, I think a lot of what I do is generalities. Uh, one of the coolest things about the preludes that Bach has in his solo cello suites are that they tend to flow with just constant 16th notes throughout and yet he's able to turn it into something that has peaks and troughs and really grows to certain moments. Uh, and he doesn't have to use rhythm to do that. He can just uh, go through these like rambling 16th notes. Uh, and another cool thing that he's able to do is generate multi voices with only one instrument. So just playing through all of those rambling 16th notes, you start to hear, oh, there's a high line that's coming out and there's a low line, and then there's all this middle stuff. Mm. Um, and so it makes one instrument sound like a collection of instruments, almost like a string quartet, or uh, in some ways you could call it orchestral. Fascinating. And, and, um, I have, oh, yes, I, sorry, I have to say that that's a lot like you know our, our show, where 
we are often rambling and then somehow there are peaks and troughs. <laughs> you know, I was thinking about that as I was talking. Uh, I tend to be that way too, so maybe I'll fit in. Um, so, so you mentioned uh, your style too. Like, how would you characterize that? Uh, well, other people characterize it as video game music style. <laughs> um, I think of my influences as Samuel Barber, uh, a little bit of Debussy, and a lot of the American Americana composers like Copland and Bernstein. Mm. Um, but my style also changes from year to year. So there was a point where I was obsessed with Hindemith. Uh, his name has come up twice already. Uh, <laughs> and there was a year that I was obsessed with like Renaissance style music. So mm -hmm. one of the movements later on sounds, uh, it's like a Bore madrigal. Mm -hmm. So the Bore is from Bach, but in a madrigal style. <laughs> wow, that's really cool. So do you, do you like to, uh, as a cellist, and when, now that you're, you know, have written for solo cello, do you tend to, sort of push the boundaries of the technical aspects of the instrument, or do you like to work sort of within them for your I, sound? Yeah, that's. I think the answer is both. I think it's really important to write a piece that's playable and that works well for an instrument uh, because then people will do it justice and people will have fun with it and they'll be able to turn it into something of their own rather, rather than just struggling through it the whole time. Uh, but I do like to push the limits when possible. And with cello, of course, I know the instrument really well. And that's why there were so many harmonics and uh, double stops and all sorts of crazy chords. Uh, but with other instruments, it's always important as a composer to be workshopping with live players and asking them, hey, does this work? Does this sound good? Or do you have something that would work even better? So, yeah, I would say it's a little bit of both. And, yeah, and I, did you? I always did you. Oh, oh sorry, I was. Yeah, oh, I was just gonna say, like, I, I, I always find when when working with uh, composers on new music that there's like an extremely fine line between it being fun, like a, a fun challenge with the technical aspects, and then just sort of being like, sorry, this just, you know, I'm just gonna do what I can, you know. Yeah, I and, feel the same way. Yeah, <laughs> but I think, you know, p composers think about this in two different ways, too. Like Bach, when he was writing music, people say that he was typically thinking about the harmonies rather than the instruments. Um, and so some of the pieces like the violin concertos work well on violin, but other pieces like cantatas or, um, you know, orchestral pieces, they could have been written for any combination of instruments and they would have worked just as well uh, and so maybe some of these modern composers are thinking more about the notes and that they want to write rather than whether they'll sound good on a specific instrument gotcha so um what like wh when did composition enter your your life like was it always there like did it happen later on it happened pretty early so i had I started piano lessons when I was nine, and my piano teacher told my parents he would only teach me if he could also teach composition. Uh, he I charge was, you double. Yeah, <laughs> charge you double. exactly, the doubling fee. Uh, so he was a Bulgarian jazz pianist, and oh, wow. um, I think he just didn't want to be playing Mozart with me the whole time. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. Um, so you've mentioned a lot of influences, like you're talking about George Crum and Bach in the same piece, which kind of blows my mind in a fun way. Um, but also, uh, and Hindemith, uh, like, do you have any, you know, you also mentioned video games, how other people see that as as something. Um, do you have influences outside of, like, the more popular classical canon? Yeah, definitely video games. Uh, okay. You know, I think we're all of that age where you grew up with the NES and games were just starting to become popular. Uh, so, yeah, I as a kid, I would play video games. We had this requirement in my house that every 30 minutes you spent playing games, you would have to practice for 30 minutes. Ooh, and so awesome. And you also couldn't save at that point. 
You know, these were these oh, old games right. where you just have to beat the whole thing. So my brother and I would take turns. We would play for 30 minutes, and then we would go over to the <laughs> piano and sit down and play piano, and we would both just, like, pick out the video game that, music by ear. That, is that a was a lot more rule. fun. That is a very good rule, actually. I like that. It, it, yeah, it, it's accountability. It. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll, I'll do that to myself. <laughs> exactly. But, but uh, man, uh, video game music, we, we, I mean, we were talking about this before the show, but it's it's great it's uh, you know it, it's, it's it's very good music so like you know that's that's a compliment you know there's some really good stuff out there now yeah um, and they try to use like big orchestral soundtracks right for yeah and, and now that the games can hold more information it's great right mm -hmm. yeah. it's so, interesting yeah with video games with video game music in general for me because a lot of it's pretty repetitive. Like, you know, we all know the Zelda theme from the original The Legend of Zelda for, for NES. Uh, and that's still worked in now into the more modern games as that like kind of continues. Um, and I feel like the more familiar you are, the more familiar you are with themes, or at least maybe the more familiar pub the public is with themes, the more they tend to like them. And uh, movie music is a good uh, example. Star Wars. Uh, Jurassic Park people love these things and video game music is very much Going in that direction because there's such an emotional connection between the game theme like the thematic material in the game the character you're playing Light and all that it's yeah, yeah, it's pretty it's it's interesting to look at um, like from a, uh, I think the technical of... term is earworm yeah, well, right, exactly. <laughs> yes. Or or light motif light motif, right? Yeah. right. <laughs> um, so, 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 Jeremy, I, I, I want to switch gears and get back to music in a sec, but um, I, I do want to touch on like all the amazing interests you have outside of, of music. Also, I mean, just to name a few, you teach pre-calculus or calculus. I well, taught pre-calculus at U of M. U of yeah. M. You draw mazes. You write yeah. science fiction, and you fiddle. Whether it's on a fiddle or a cello, we're not sure, but um, but but you you fiddle on something. So yeah. uh, so <laughs> can you like talk about your favorite <laughs> one of those hobbies and like how you got into that? Yes. Oh yeah. man, which one's yeah. the best? Which one's the best? Can we start with <laughs> mazes? Actually, can we just start with the mazes one? <laughs> oh yeah, I can definitely start with mazes. I mean, everything I do is is really fun and creative. I growing up, people would always ask me like, oh, what hobbies do you have? And I would say, oh, composing. And they're like, no, I mean outside of music. I'm like, well, um, I, I don't know. And so that's when I started drawing mazes, just so that I would have a <laughs> hobby that I could tell people. Uh, <laughs> but it's really fun. Is yeah. there like a maze community? Like, do you like send them out and share like what you've come up with? In a, it's like a, a tuba convention, Dude, right? Scott, <laughs> you be. ever heard of the maze communities? They're amazing. Uh, of Great. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, there, there's a difference between mazes and labyrinths, by the way. Um, but, oh. yeah, you know, the labyrinths are those things you walk on on the ground that some yeah. of them, they yeah. don't actually have an end point. It's just there to be oh, meditative. Gotcha. That's a labyrinth. I could see there being a, com a community of, like, labyrinth enthusiasts. But how, uh, how would you find them? Yeah, you just start walking and hope you <laughs> eventually meet up. Right. Because they, they never get out, right? Yeah. And, That's and a I'm good just, idea, though, joining a community. I hadn't thought about that. I just <laughs> draw mazes for my friends. Um, usually they're like picture mazes, like uh, a sunset or a caterpillar. Um, wow. And I like trying to draw them so that when you fill in the solution, then it generates another picture. So I have this caterpillar maze, which maybe I can send you and you can post it up, up above, which is um, when you fill in the solution to the caterpillar maze, it makes a butterfly. Oh, that's awesome. Inside it. Yeah, it's called metamorphosis, like Hindemith's metamorphosis, symphonic metamorphosis. <laughs> Very cool. Not to bring him up. We're going to let's try and get five <laughs> times. In this interview, we're yeah. at three. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It would be an unprecedented number of times. So yeah. Come um, right. Do you ever feel like the, the mazes are like a painting, sort of like by Matisse, like Matisse, the painter? Um, so I have no visual art skills, and this was my way to 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 pretend like I can draw something 
uh, oh. but it's actually it's super technical, so it's actually really easy for me to do them. But if you put me with a paintbrush, I would, you know, <laughs> draw stick figures. Or... Sorry, I was trying to go for a full circle around back to Hindemith. It oh, is, it's, actually, <laughs> it's actually kind of fascinating. Easter Mahler. Oh yeah, <laughs> nice. Oh, got it. <laughs> Shoot, um, I shouldn't have interrupted you. That was great. That was good. It, so it's, uh, it's fascinating. It sounds like like you have a very like technical side of you like the calculus and 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 the mazes and and and, you know practicing cello then you have like a very creative outlet like like composing and um writing the science fiction which i i also would like to hear about i don't know how like when you started doing that but 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 yeah like are you published i'm not published I right. I have a long way to go. Publishers just... here, you know, get on it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all, all the publishers I watching. <laughs> yeah, I, it's a secret hobby of mine, but it it still happens to be on my public bio for some reason. <laughs> um, well kept secret. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, like I also like to dance, and that's something I'm really terrible at. But there's something fun about like learning a new skill mm-hmm. and seeing how much progress you can make Mm -hmm. and i feel the same way with science fiction like every page that i write i feel like i'm getting a little bit better and learning skills about how to develop characters or or create interesting plot lines Uh, but i would not call myself a very good or even decent science fiction writer do you have a favorite (laughs) book or go-to book that you you know enjoy that inspired you um i love the old science fiction writers from like mid 20th century uh like isaac asimov uh love his stuff or uh orson scott card i think a lot of these people sort of predicted things that would happen in the modern day and now they've happened Mm -hmm. uh you know things like smartphones which they didn't you know they there's no way they could have known that we would be having devices in our pockets that carry giga quads of data right uh, but yeah i think back then it was so much more interesting um because the world was at our fingertips but we didn't even know it mm-hmm. and now uh it seems like science fiction is a lot more about just drama or reta- retelling the same uh, post-apocalyptic story mm-hmm. uh you know just with a different character and a different oppressive government <laughs> right Wait. Asimov is the iRobot, right? He wrote iRobot, and he wrote Foundation, which is actually a very mathematical book. Uh, and he also wrote a bunch of short stories. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, isn't iRobot like a little frankenstein e? Yes. Yeah, and the book is very different from the movie, too. But iRobot, I think that was the first time we saw the three rules of uh, yes. robot, robotic. Yeah which are now, they're like the epitome of science fiction movies. You always hear about them, and Asimov came up with them. Wow. Interesting. That's cool. Do you, when, you're, when, you're, uh, when you're writing the things that you're writing, do you find yourself trying to kind of predict in the ways that you, you feel like they were doing in mid-century? Yeah. Yeah, I try. I mean, I think it's interesting to just bend the rules, and maybe this ties back to composition, too. Uh, but combining so first of all fusing different styles together uh fusing what one author has done with another one uh and then secondly just like picking a rule and bending it so one of the concepts i came up with was what if there's three separate planets and each one is 200 years in the past of the other one so it's like this sort of paradoxical time thing where someone will be digging an archaeological site and they'll figure out these events from the past world. But then when you cycle to the third world, you realize, wait a second, everything's in this cycle of time that doesn't make any sense. And I got this idea from uh, a book called The Cloud Atlas. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah, you know, just approaching that, taking that concept and then turning into my, it into my own thing that's that is interesting. really interesting yeah, yeah that's that's amazing man very, <laughs> very creative that's awesome wait with all these different interests um uh, what do you think that um like in school when you were growing up or, or did you have like favorite subjects were you like 
uh, did you feel like school was great for you and you could explore or was it like terrible and you felt constra constrained in the rules? Like, how was that just growing up as a musician and as not a musician? Yeah. So um, you may not know, but I was homeschooled. Ah. I My first class was at age 15. I went to my Spanish class in college at eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, I showed up and was so eager to prove myself to all the other students <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> because it was the first time I had been the, in the room with other people. Uh, but I definitely breezed through math growing up. My older brother and I were taking the same classes at the same time, like we would use the same textbooks. And so I was basically two years ahead in math. I'm, I'm uh, sure he loved that. <laughs> yeah, I don't, we, you know, we weren't very competitive. Yeah. We just had fun together. So I don't know if uh, people so, heard that college college at fifteen. And yeah. So <laughs> Jimmy, were you, did you did you go to college at fifteen, or were you taking classes at a college at home? Like what what were you? I went to doing? college at fifteen. Okay, so you were at U of M, or where where'd you go? I I went to a liberal arts college. So I'm from Arkansas, and if you're wondering about the fiddle, uh, I play fiddle <laughs> on the violin. It's almost a requirement down here in Arkansas, which is where I <laughs> happen to be right now. Uh, but my sisters, my two sisters and I all entered fiddle competitions on violin and wow. we have trophies from when we scored like top in the state. Um, yes. I would awesome. not place myself at Kim Kennedy's level by <laughs> any means. Uh, <laughs> but it, yeah, so I went to college at 15 at a liberal arts college here called Hendrix College. Okay. And to me, it felt like high school. Uh, a lot of the courses I took, I didn't take in high school, like calculus uh, or chemistry or biology. Um, and my fellow students were all telling me, yeah, I learned this in high school. I don't know why we're relearning it. Uh, so at this point, I feel like high school and college, you could just skip all of high school and go to college and learn the same things. Yeah. Uh, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it says, you, it says you. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, the amount that I learned in either, I think, doesn't amount to much. So. <laughs> yeah. And you got your uh -huh. D. So yeah, and then you got your DMA at 24, which is pretty. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it just went straight through. Yeah. And so, do you, do you have a degree in math as well? I have an undergraduate degree in math. Okay. Uh, and my senior thesis was actually on drawing mazes. Uh, so everything's just tied together. Yeah. Uh, so, my, yeah. Sorry. So do you do you ever sleep? Does your mind? Yeah, go seriously. <laughs> well, I don't have a baby yet. You know, I feel like that's when the time just disappears. I don't okay. know. <laughs> so so um, maybe for people who like have, you know, I, I guess are going through life and, and music isn't always a clear path. Um, how, how did you, you know, choose between all these different you know possibilities you know did was was music always a clear path for you or it was not always clear um i always knew i wanted to do music but when i got to college i figured like i i should have a backup plan so and i was also really interested in math and computer science and so i was taking these classes uh at my senior recital uh, i don't think i played Hindemith there, but at my senior recital, my math professor <laughs> came up to me. Yeah, we're getting close. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> one more, baby, one more. Uh, yeah, my math professor came up to me after the concert and he said, uh, I just wanted to let you know, I'm not going to write you a recommendation letter uh, because I think it would be a waste of your music talent to, to settle and go wow. get a graduate degree in math. Um, you would be perfectly fine at math, but if you are if you wanted a degree in math just so you could make more money, um, I don't think it's worth it. And he was also someone who said that I thought in the box too much, which surprised me because I I you know I'm such I have so many creative interests, but somehow when it came to math, I was always just putting myself in in a box. And so if it weren't for him, I might have tried to get a math degree and. Wow be like an accountant or an actuary or one of those desk jobs. Wow. 
Interesting. I, I, that, um, that sounds like, I, I didn't realize math could be out of the box. I feel like math is like, <laughs> like, like that is the box. Like, like, you know, like there's a clear way to do it. So that's like, I, yeah, that's, that's uh, news to me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I love proving things. You know, if someone gives you a problem, I can find an answer. Uh, but thinking up the new problems or like, what is that saying about what you know the more you know the more you know that you don't know <laughs> yeah i think i've heard yeah. that one <laughs> yeah something like that uh that's i math is always on the forefront of um of of these fields of research because um you know there's so much you can learn about just the natural numbers natural numbers are you know from one one two three four like integers but positive um there's so much you can learn about them uh yeah it's there's yeah <laughs> that's that's great i mean i never had that experience with math it was always like more of a chore and i don't know um what that says about me but I wanted to ask you, I feel like we have a, an excellent opportunity as somebody who has the different perspectives in music in all these different ways. For someone who has no idea who Hindemith is, and for like so, for the people that might be watching thinking, hey, I like the symphony, but I don't know which concert to go to because I don't know how any of these pieces go. Um, would you give them like is there a recommendation on how to start that you because it seems to give a genuine curiosity and a lot of different things and knowing as much as you know now like what would be your advice to someone just starting listening like just starting to listen to classical music or sure. hit it <laughs> well, uh, classical music let's say let's make it broad yeah so the way that i approach classical music is uh keep as open mind and open mind as possible um it's really easy to get stuck in a rut thinking that classical music is the music that puts you to sleep or the music that you relax to or hear in an elevator or a shopping mall. And uh, there's so much more that can happen if you keep an open mind. Um, now, a lot of the music that we play in DSO is uh, commissioned music or really modern pieces. And on first listen, they are not going to sound anything like Pachelbel's Canon or uh, Yezu Joy or you know the Bach cello suites. But um, if you learn a little bit about them beforehand, and then uh, instead of thinking like, oh, does this music sound pretty? If you're thinking, does this music make me feel something or does it take me on an adventure? Uh, then you can have a great musical experience without ever feeling like, um, you know, like you're happy or or overjoyed hearing it. You know, there's mm -hmm. there's Beethoven's Ode to Joy, and then there's something like Hindemit, which is very mathematical, uh, but there's there's some great qualities to it if you just take the time to listen. Uh, we just did a piece a couple weeks ago um, about the Detroit Book Tower. That, that piece that was commissioned. Uh, and I was sitting there with the composer in the audience listening to uh, the orchestra play during the rehearsals and reading about the book Tower and reading what she wrote about it. Uh, reading a composer's notes, not the musical notes, but the notes that they write about their own piece goes a long way towards you know getting into their mind and understanding why they put those particular notes in a certain order. So if you ever if you ever come across a piece you haven't heard before, try to find some notes from the composer that you can read about before you listen to the piece for the first time. That's great advice. Yeah, really good advice. You know, I always felt like reading even like, you know, a lot of program notes have hi the history too of, you know, you know especially older pieces, kind of like the climate of what was going on and I always found that to be really uh, illuminating to kind of know what was happening to this composer at that time. And, you know, and, and it kind of, um, you know, makes you kind of, it puts you in that, in that time period. And it, I feel like that helps a lot too. One of my favorite ones is uh, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, which everybody knows, you know. 
And there's actually some documented evidence out there. I think it might have been like a letter from his cousin or uncle that those four notes that you hear, that he actually was inspired by a bird call. Mm. Uh, and now we think of it as like fate knocking on the door because it's such a low interval that you hear. Right. Uh, but it's possible that he was just listening to the birds outside his window. Yeah. <laughs> right. Wow. That's amazing. And then, you know, Mahler always is inspired by like the, you know, the cows walking around and, you know, the calls and, you know, like it, it's cool to hear how they interpret that, you know, whereas yeah. someone like Messian is very literal with like... <laughs> the bird calls you know right um, this is what a bird sounds yeah like. <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly uh um, so, jeremy i have a question for you how how often do you write notes about the music that you're writing so uh for modern composers it's really important to have that especially if you want to sell your piece to someone and get them to play it so either before or after i finish a piece i always write program notes for the piece um, and the program notes are either uh, how did I construct the piece? If there's some unique way that it was constructed, then I feel like it's important to mention that. I'll put it down. Or if it's a more programmatic piece, then I will write um, notes about uh, you know what inspired the piece, what composers inspired it, what styles, um, what bird calls. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Man. That's terrific. Um, I have to say, in, in these unprecedented times, it's really a treat to get to know um, our, our fellow musicians on this like deeper level. And uh, with as many interests as you have, this is this has just been fantastic. Thank yeah. you so much for, it's for joining yeah, us. Really and, inspiring, you know. Pre appreciate you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so I've, much. I've loved being on the show. So nice yeah. to see you guys again. Looking forward to playing with you all. Yeah, let's yeah. make some music together soon, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, thank you, Jeremy. Appreciate you, man. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye.